Most retail and e-commerce store owners think that their customers know exactly what they want. So they post products on social media and they ask for feedback like, which do you prefer, the pink or the red? And I totally get it. When you're investing in stock, you want to try and forecast what is going to sell best. So it's easy to think that by simply asking customers what they want, you'll not only build your customer engagement and you'll get hype around potential new products, you'll also get strategic advice that will allow you to judge how much stock you need to buy. But if you've ever posted on social media in the hopes of getting customer input on what they'll actually buy, only to spend hundreds or even thousands of dollars in bringing in new stock, only to have it sitting on your shelves collecting dust or sitting in your warehouse collecting dust, you are likely falling into the same trap that many unsuspecting retailers end up in. And the fact is, it is costing you thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars every single month. And it's lumping a huge amount of financial stress on your shoulders to the point where sometimes it can feel like it's a weight on your chest and you can't even breathe. Welcome to the Bringing Business to Retail podcast, where I, Selena Knight, share strategies, interview retail revolutionaries, and delve into the minds of e-commerce experts to help you grow a profitable, independent retail or e-commerce business. If you're stuck in a rut, or if you feel like business is way harder than it should be, or you've overachieved all of the things that you've set out to and are wondering what to do next, or how do I even make this better? I know that you're going to love today's episode. If you're stuck in a rut, feel like business is way harder than it should be, or you've achieved all of the things that you set out to and are wondering what next, or how do I even make this better? Then I know that you're going to love today's episode. Hey there, and welcome to the Bringing Business to Retail show. If I was to ask you to go into your stockroom or to your warehouse right now and pull out any of the items that have been sitting there for more than, let's say 60 days, how much space would that stock fill? Would it fill a box or maybe a couple of boxes? Would it fill a couple of boxes on a few shelves? Or would it fill a lot of boxes on a lot of shelves? Well, This is exactly what I did with one of my consultancy clients during one of our sessions together. And it, from memory, it took them about most of a day, about seven hours to do this. And the result was dozens upon dozens of boxes that not only filled a room, but also spilled out into the hallway, into the kitchen area, and I kid you not, even into the bathroom. And you might be thinking, OMG, how could they possibly have that much idle stock? Surely this must be a multi-million dollar company to have that much stuff that hadn't sold in 60 days. Well, I can tell you that they weren't turning over even a million dollars, but the value of that stock that we put into, well, that they put into those boxes in the hallway, in the storeroom, in the kitchen, in the bathroom, was tens upon tens of thousands of dollars. So if I asked you to tally up how much your idle stock was worth, what would that number be? How much, what what would the total be? I'm guessing it's probably a lot, right? One of the things I learned as a multi-award winning retail strategist is that what customers tell you they want and what they'll actually hand over their cold hard cash for are two very different things. Yet every single day I see retail and e-commerce store owners crowdsourcing what is essentially a foundational business strategy from their customers by asking for their input. Now a successful profitable business is made up of five core pillars. You've probably heard me talking about these before. Money, sales, customers, marketing, and impact. And when you have this huge amount of money, this huge amount of cash, tied up in idle inventory, we call it aged inventory, essentially it's your unsold stock, 
even though your first thought would probably be to put it all on sale so you can try and recoup some money, what you really need to do is work out why it's not moving. Hey there, Sal here, and I'm going to get right back to this episode, but I just wanted to jump in real quick and let you know that my free business growth videos, the Retail Breakthrough Series, are going to drop on August the 26th. Now, I only release this series a couple of times a year, and this time around, I have re-recorded all of the videos with brand new content, and it's going to break down exactly why you are working harder than you ever have before, but you're still not seeing those results in your bank account, and why you're unable to get past six figures, and how to fix all of that in a way that almost no other retail or e-commerce store owner is doing. So if you are ready to step out of the overworked, underpaid shopkeeper identity, pre-register for immediate access when the Retail Breakthrough Series drops over at selinanight.com forward slash breakthrough. On the surface, asking customers if they prefer the pink hibiscus print or the green palm leaves might boost your engagement and get lots of comments like, when can I buy these? Oh, I gotta have them. But the fact is, until your customers actually hand over those credit card details or hand over their physical credit card, you cannot be forecasting your inventory strategy based on random comments from people that you don't even know. I see this all the time. People posting inside of Facebook groups, they are desperately trying to drum up interest and feedback on a product from people who aren't their ideal customers. And they do it in the hopes that they're going to get some engagement, maybe some traffic to their website or some clicks through to their Instagram and potentially a handful of sales. But this strategy doesn't work. And sure, you can look around at a lot of successful retail and e-commerce stores looking at their social feeds and you might say, but Sal, These guys are posting this kind of feedback questions every single week. And yeah, you're right, they do. They're getting customer engagement, they're getting the interaction, and building up a hype in a product is 100% necessary. That is part of marketing. However, when it becomes the basis for your entire buying strategy, that is when you encounter problems. This is such an outdated marketing tactic that when it comes down to it, it simply backfires and can cause cause a huge amount of financial strain. So going back to those boxes that I had you pull out of your stock room or your warehouse, even if it was just in the back of your mind, if your aged inventory fills more than just a handful of boxes, The stress that comes with having, now that you've been made aware of it, the stress that comes with having all of that cash tied up, the pressure associated with trying to clear that stock out so you can recognize some of that cash flow, it can be like all consuming. It can keep you awake at night and it can force you to discount stock even if you don't want to. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be waking up at 2 a.m. in the morning stressing about whether I can pay my mortgage this month, do you? No. So let's look at some real strategies that you can use that are less crowdsourcing, finger crossing, and just plain winging it, and more fact focused, fact based, so that you have the best chance of getting more sales faster. Now, when I work with clients, one of the first things that we do when it comes to forecasting is use the historical data that they have inside of their website or their point of sale system to make an informed decision on what sells, when it sells, and how much of it sells. Cold, hard sales data is much more likely to lead to a better buying decision than a handful of comments on Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok, or whatever social platform you are focusing on. So using the data that you've got is the first place to go when you're trying to build a forecasting purchasing strategy. The second thing that I like to do, 
And this one sort of depends on you and where you find the best data. It's all about the data. Is finding your trend analysis tool of choice. Now this could be some keyword researching. You might use a tool like Google Trends or I do have people who use the Amazon search data. So they track Amazon search data to see if significantly more people are searching for green palm leaf cushions or pink hibiscus cushions. Because when you have that information, even though it you're trying to forecast for the future, we're putting all of this data together so that you can make a decision, a purchasing strategy based on information, not just fingers crossed hoping for it, okay? So historical sales data and trend analysis. Remember, trend analysis is just that. I wouldn't use trend analysis if I'm looking to purchase six months out. If you're doing an indent order for next season, I probably wouldn't use, I might look at the, the trend over time to see if it's increasing or decreasing, but I wouldn't base my whole entire purchasing strategy based on trend data, okay? These are just tools that you're using in your toolkit to make informed decisions. Okay, so trend data, historical analysis, and the last thing, it's, it is a little bit of winging it, but it is to trust your instincts. So let me tell you a little bit of a story. We used to make, uh, when I had my retail stores, we used to manufacture these baby girl pinafore dresses. And I would personally pick every run of fabric. We used to bring the fabric in from America and I would pick every single bolt. That was one of my jobs as the CEO of the business. I chose to take that on, research and development and product design. So we would only ever do limited edition runs, which meant we would maybe get one or two bolts of fabric, so 10, 20, maybe 30 yards, which meant at the most, we would maybe end up with about 100 dresses in a particular print. And because the dresses were reversible, um, sometimes those would be, there'd be two prints, like a like an outside print and then two inside prints because they were reversible. Now, I remember still to this day, I still have this scrap of fabric in my sewing kit. And it was this green printed, kind of like a flowery kind of picture on a, a bony white background. And, oh, sorry. It was, a, it was a dark green on a light green background because I wanted, I remember now, I wanted the bone, like the white background, but I couldn't get it. So I had to get the green background. And even when the bolts of fabric came in, I thought they were great. But when they got made up into dresses, I really, really didn't like them. I just, I just thought they weren't the right print for a baby. So I put all of these dresses, I think there were, between 50 and 100 dresses. And that, they were dresses that sold at $40 each. That's like $2,000 worth of stock that I literally put into a garbage bag. And we had all of these racks in the storeroom. And right at the top was a, a, sh a shelf that we pretty much only used for empty boxes because you had to get a ladder to put stuff in there. And I remember putting this stuff in a garbage bag and just kind of lobbing it up to the top shelf into a big box that was up there like a basketball and there they stayed and those dresses stayed there for a very long time until one of my team members was cleaning out the stock room it rained for five days straight and she took it upon herself to just clear out the stock room she wiped all the shelves down and she got the ladder out and she found this box with the green dresses and she pulled them out and she obviously thought that they'd been put up there by mistake and she brought them out, she tagged them, she put them into the point of sale, she even snapped a couple of decent pictures, put them on the website, put them out on display, put them on social media, and they sold. But I didn't know this. So I walked in the next day and here they were front and center on the table at the front of the shop. And I was like, what are they doing out there? Not those, no, you've got to get rid of those dresses. And she was, what are you talking about? And I said, I hate those dresses. No one will ever buy those dresses. That print is not for little girls. And she said, mm, I think you're a little bit wrong there, Sal, because I've already sold six of them. Overnight, we've sold six of them. 
And the moral of this story is you should never doubt yourself. You really should trust your own instincts. Because when I bought that fabric, I thought it was right. And yet I had those second thoughts, which meant for probably 12 months, $2,000 worth of revenue was sitting in a garbage bag, in a box, on a top shelf. Now that is just stupid, right? You can see that. If I would have sold those dresses, I could have reinvested that $2,000 over and over and over again. And if I reinvested that $2,000 for 12 months, I could have made 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars. Who knows? Depending on the products that I bought. So I should have listened to myself. I should have trusted my instincts as someone who'd been in this game for a long time. And that's kind of my last tip is to trust your instincts because customers connect not only with what you sell, but also why you sell it. There's a reason that they follow you. There's a reason they've given you their email address. There's a reason that they open your emails because they've connected with your brand. And this is something that we actually go into inside of Scale Your Store, understanding who is going to buy, why they buy, and how to get them to spend their money with you. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking pink hibiscus cushions or green baby dresses. The fact is customers love what you sell because you have curated the range. And if you start to deviate from that, when you hand over the decision making to customers who may have never even purchased from you, you are putting your entire financial future at risk. Now, unless you're spending countless hours navigating cost customer comments and matching them up to people who are in your customer database and then looking at historical spending, there's a better than good chance that the people who are commenting on your Facebook posts aren't going to buy anyway. So you can't make your business decisions based on what these customers comment on your social media. Businesses grow when they have a strategy in place when the CEO or the owner of the business knows what they need to focus on to move the needle and where they need to get that data to make those decisions. And struggling retail or e-commerce store owners that are relying on this customer input to build that strategy, generally are the ones that are putting in way more into their business than they're getting back. They're overworked, they're under, they're overworked, <laughs> they're overworked and they're overwhelmed. And there is this, they're walking around with this constant pressure to find the next sale sitting on their shoulders. So if you are one of those people who is always on Facebook groups, hustling, trying to land a sale here and there, guys, that's not a growth strategy. That is a recipe for bankruptcy. And that is not where I want you to end up. So I want you to take these strategies, take this information and use it. If nothing else, just go to your stock room or to your warehouse or even into your point of sale or the back end of your website and look at that aged inventory. How much is it worth? And most importantly, remember, it's not just a, an excuse to put everything on sale, but most importantly, why is it not selling? Okay, why is it not selling? And once you have worked that out, then you can choose the best way to move that inventory and recoup the cash flow that is tied up. Thank you guys so much for being here on today's episode. I hope it's been super helpful and I can't wait to see you on our next episode. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Bringing Business to Retail podcast. You can find all of the show notes over at selenanight.com. If you found something that you heard today particularly useful, I'd love it if you could leave me a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And of course, feel free to share this episode with someone that you think could benefit by listening to it. Want more retail biz strategies? You can watch the Bringing Business to Retail TV show where each week I'll answer a question or provide you with a simple, actionable retail biz strategy that you can implement in your business right away. If you have a question or a guest, I'd love to hear from you. Drop my team an email at podcast at selenanight.com and I'll see you on the next episode. Have a great week.